and a non-traditional student, so I really appreciate the flexibility of the courses offered at CT State. I can take them anywhere in the state. It's super easy to register and explore the options, which allows me to explore my own interests and really personalize my degree. What CT State has meant for me as a professor has been to have the ability to work with colleagues from across the state and to collaborate on the best opportunities for our students. We can focus on our programs and areas of support services, while at the same time having the ability to have a strong local community presence for our campuses. Students can seamlessly explore areas of interest, either for career or for transfer. It is a very exciting time for us. I think why I love my experience at CT State has got to do with the honors program that I am in in uh, CT State Middlesex. The faculty are just so dedicated to ensuring that we succeed. They really feel like they care about us. They provide a lot of in-depth advising, not only on stuff to do with our college, but also the transfer process. They feel like they are dedicated to us long term. And also having a cohort of other dedicated students really helps to uh, encourage each other and provide a sense of camaraderie. CT State is working for all the students everywhere in the state. You can attend classes anywhere you want, at any time you want. It could be through Flex. It could be through online. And there is a great opportunity for any student to make sure that they could get in focus for their career their academic advancement, and knowing that there's student support behind them. I really appreciate the opportunity to promote CT State. And as I say, CT State is great. Since the merge, we have not had the option of choosing classes across our 12 campuses, whether online or in person. And this gives us more flexibility. At CT State, what sets us apart is our commitment to each student's unique journey and our unwavering dedication to their success. Every task, every effort is aimed at empowering our students to thrive academically and personally. At my campus, CT State Middlesex, it's more than just a workplace. It's a community that values each individual's contribution. Through shared passion and collaboration, we're creating an environment where students flourish. It's the incredible sense of support that truly distinguishes us. Together, we're making CT State a truly special place. I live in Wallingford, which is really close to New Haven, so I take my local train to commute to campus, and I use the U-Pass that is given to students. You could use it for the train and for the bus, and students get free rides. Hello, my name is Dr. Tim Shizumi, and I am the program coordinator for the MLT program at CT State Quinnebog Valley, the only two-year associate's degree program for medical laboratory technician in the state of Connecticut. Lo que amo de CT State es poder ser parte de PTK y la colaboración que hemos tenido con la administración y el apoyo que nos dan a los estudiantes. So what I love about CT State is we pride ourselves in putting student first. I love that, just being able to make sure that we're able to assist students, at least from an admissions perspective, um, helping them as soon as they walk through the door, making sure they have all the right connections throughout their entire process uh, with registration. The people. Not only do I get to work with amazing faculty, staff, and coworkers, but as a Guided Pathway Advisor and Community Conversations Club Advisor, I get to work with amazing international and ESOL students from around the world. These are talented and gifted and amazing students who bring with them a wealth of knowledge, experience, and diverse backgrounds to our campuses. It is my joy to come alongside them on their academic journey and to watch them grow in connections, confidence, and leadership. And in turn, I learn so much from them. As an early childhood PC, I'm grateful for my fellow early childhood faculty across Connecticut State. Their brilliance, ingenuity, and dedication to young children provide our students with a rigorous study of the young child, preparing them to provide quality care and education for children across Connecticut. 
I am proud and honored to work alongside all of my colleagues, both here at Northwestern and across Connecticut State. I am CT State. I am CT State. I am CT State. I am CT State. I am Kim Hogan, CEO of CT State Middlesex. Welcome to the Connecticut Community College inaugural State of the CT State event. <laughs> For those of you watching us, welcome to CT State Middlesex, and we're just so happy to have everyone from all ends of the state, both in person and virtual. I hope you enjoyed our opening montage. Uh, that was created by our Center for New Media Productions, along with live talent from across all of our campuses. I don't know about you, but viewing this just energized me to get ready for this semester. Please let me welcome Dr. John Maduco, our CT State President, and Dr. Levy Brown, Provost for CT State. Welcome. In just a moment, I'm going to start off our event by asking Drs. Maduco and Brown a series of five questions that have been sent in uh, as we were planning the event. And then we're going to take questions from our live audience. When we're asking questions, I'll come around with the mic, wait for me to get there, we'll ask your questions so that we could get a good live audio feed for our uh, viewing audience. This recording is going to be shared on YouTube Live, which means it's recorded and can be viewed later. For those that can't watch with us, you can share it um, and they can watch it later. Everything sound good? We're good to go? All right, time check, we're at 11.07. Dr. Murduko, we just had a great interview with you on CNN. I don't, I don't know if the audience got to see it. I know my audience saw it yesterday at an inauguration event. Um, you're getting pretty good at this. A little bit, yeah. A little bit? <laughs> National coverage, really? Yeah, All right. sure. Well, <laughs> I think it's a good way to get started for today. Uh, I'm really glad to have you here. Uh, with the first question that we have is up for you. Um, you have led us through the merger in your first year and a half on the job. Can you highlight for us what you see as the greatest accomplishments CT State has achieved to date? And what do you see as our priorities of focus for the next year or two as we stabilize our college? Yeah, thank you for the question. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I love the fact that Kim Hogan's a taskmaster, so keeping us on time, that's one of her many strengths. Um, hard to pick just one. You know, I, think, I think the first one in terms of accomplishment is the level of empathy. Um, that our faculty and staff had for each other throughout the process of the merger. Um, I saw that firsthand, recognizing that it was difficult, it was hard, um, in some cases, in a lot of cases, infuriating. Um, I think, two, our unwavering support for our students. We, we know that our students are going through a lot. We know college students nationally are going through a lot as, as it relates to their insecurities or mental health or finances and the level of support that our faculty, our staff, our foundations um, continue to provide um, is stellar. And that's something that's been recognized nationally, both at the level of the White House, by the Washington Journal, um, in terms of what we do day in and day out. I think, too, our level of student success. Um, this is something that I'm adamant about. I know that the perception and the narrative about what was the 12 legacy community colleges and what is now CT State is that somehow we're broken, somehow our students don't do well, somehow if you are black or brown or immigrant or single parent, you don't do well. That's, that's never been true. Um, and we can demonstrate um, tremendous levels of, of success across our campuses and our programs and our disciplines. Um, last but not least, I think the greatest accomplishment that we relive day in and day out is that our college, we reflect and we represent the great state of Connecticut. We look like Connecticut, how we smell like Connecticut. Maybe that's a compliment. Um, we are the only institution in this great state um, that does not turn people away. Right? And I think that's, right, that is, that is core to our mission, that is core to our values. And if I'm a resident of this great state, that's the type of institution I want to attend, I want to advocate for, I want to fund, et cetera. We have to tell that story, you know, day in and day out, right, to the, to the people of Connecticut that we do not turn them away, right? We do not judge you on past mistakes, where you are in life, the fact that you are a first responder or a parent, or that you got ill and had to take care of yourself or your family members, um, or that you're putting your community first, right? We're proud that we get to 
serve those individuals, right? And we, and we have to be more vocal about that. So those are my, it wasn't one Miss Hogan, it was like eight of them, but I'm not gonna apologize for it. Hey, here yeah. you go. Yeah. All right. Ready for our next question? Yeah. All right, this one, this one goes to you as well, but we want Dr. Brown to jump in and fill in for a bit of it. Um, it's a long question, so are you ready? Okay, Connecticut State educates Connecticut workforce as part of our mission. Can you talk through how you and the provost are both providing the infrastructure and collaborating across state agencies to grow our workforce and academic programs? Also, how do you envision building alignment with non-credit to credit pathways? What are the new areas of programming that perhaps we can innovate? And what are our growth opportunities and how does this segue in with the current proposed academic planning process and program review? Just everything, all at once. Okay. <laughs> That's a tough question, guys. Yeah, happy new year. Um, we can break it down however Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Um, so for starters, you know, my approach to workforce development and, and all things academic is that they're one and the same. All things that we do is workforce, all things that we do is academic. So that's, that's important. Um, two, I do not believe in a class system where we put credit students and non-credit students in different buckets. A student is a student, right? And we have to speak to that truth um, intentionally and authentically all day, every day. Um, three, we serve, we proudly serve um, more than 70,000 students annually. Um, so no, not only are we the largest community college in New England, we are the largest college in Connecticut. So nearly one out of four college students in Connecticut is a CT State student. And I think with that, I think that's the context and the framing that we have to tell the state in terms of what we provide. We're the largest provider of workforce development in Connecticut. Um, I think, too, pro to leadership of Provost Brown, but obviously pro to leadership of our campus leaders, our workforce directors, our campus deans, our school deans. Um, the coordination that we are undergoing in this state is complicated. Uh, we have five regional workforce boards that don't always see eye to eye, um, and we communicate and work with them almost daily. Um, we serve on the governor's workforce council, so we get to partner with all of the state agencies to ensure that CT State is always at the table when it comes to the planning um, and, and strategy of workforce development. I think, too, we know that business and industry play a huge role, and now that we've merged, you know, we have to do a better job um, inviting and re-engaging with our business and industry leaders on our campuses, but not through a centralized process where it's only New Britain having those conversations. It's really by the campus, right? So local industries have an affinity and a relationship with the campus in their respective service area. We have to leverage those relationships. We have to leverage that proximity. Um, and then last but not least, before I turn it over to um, Provost Brown, um, we have to, and this is going to be a broken record, but we have to tell our story. So I want to say that we served was it north of 12,000 workforce development students in, in, in this past fall semester? Seated students. Duplicate. Right? Yes, that's right. You know, duplicate students, right? That, that's a tremendous amount. Yeah. Um, and we have to celebrate those individuals. We have to tell their own success stories. We have to remind the industry partners across the state that without us, uh, you would be hurting even more. And kind of go from there, right? So workforce development is a 24-7 year-round phenomenon. But I'm really... I'm really proud of our workforce directors and, and other individuals who are involved. Um, we need to do more, um, but, but it's, it starts with me to really advocate uh, to the governor, to our chancellor, to others that we're doing great things, but we need that support continuously to do more. Provost Brown? Yeah, I'll just add, you know, um, we do view um, students as one um, entity. The, the whole notion of non-credit and credit, we're really working collectively with workforce directors, other leaders, our school deans, um, and other administrators to help ensure that we do view a student as a student, no matter which door they come into um, here at CT State. Um, the other thing that we're doing internally uh, as we have moved through the first semester here as provost is we're collectively uh, making sure that we include the right voices at the table, a combination of faculty, uh, staff, um, as well as you know, key academic administrators um, with the launch of the most recent Workforce Development Council um, internally as well as the Advanced Manufacturing Councils. Those voices will help us to better position um, our workforce development um, programs and also leaning on the, the talent 
um, that is within, right? We have brilliant minds across CT State. I've learned that in my first seven months um, here. And so what we should be doing and what we are working towards doing is including multiple voices, um, various skill sets to help make sure that we are making informed decisions on non-credit and credit programs to meet the workforce needs across um, the great state of Connecticut. Um, additionally, you know, I know it was embedded in there about non-credit and credit pathway opportunities. Um, there are de definitely national models of success um, that can help inform our work. I know that some good work has been done. We will continue to pick that work up and lift it up and elevate it even more um, as a collaborative. Uh, and we will continue to leverage our um, connectivity with national partners, with state leaders, to make sure that we're responding to the workforce demand. Um, one of the things that we have continued to talk about is really following the data and making data informed decisions. So what are some of the new job opportunities that are coming to Connecticut? What are some of the uh, key data points about um, those jobs that may be coming in the future or they are underfilled right now? Those are some of the types of questions we need to continue to ask ourselves and those are the conversations that we're having collectively to help make sure that we are sponsoring and creating the correct pathways for both non-credit students as well as our credit students as well. And so that's what I wanted to add to the conversation and appreciate President Maduco and, and CEO Hogan for having me here today. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're doing really well on time. We're at about 11.15. And our next question, Dr. Maduco, I'm going to keep you right on target. I know. You know. <laughs> CT State values diversity, equity, and inclusion as one of our core principles. Can you overview what initiatives and steps Next steps you see T CT State taking as it relates to our equity agenda, and are there specific populations we need to focus on in the years ahead to ensure their access and success in higher education is met? How are we investing in DEI work, and what are our outcomes to date? Yeah, Again, great. another loaded question. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, and I'll deviate slightly and then really address the points you brought up. So I, I received a text message um, from, from a colleague who is a president of a state college in Florida. Uh, I want to say 11, 12 years ago, Florida converted their 28 community colleges into state colleges um, so they could also begin to offer baccalaureate degrees. And she texted me and said that uh, the Florida Department of Education has finalized uh, the banning of all DEI anything at their two-year colleges in the state of Florida, right? Like, it's done from the funding, from the staffing, from the very mentioning of equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging, et cetera, right? So it is, you know, how many days are we in 2024? And you have something like that taking place in this country. And that's not the only place that that's happening. It's happening in other states, right? Um, and her, it wasn't questioning, it was like, what am I supposed to do? Like, turn, you know, turn off my values, turn off the very people and communities that I have, have vowed to, to serve, right? How, how can I navigate in this environment, you know? So to, to hear that, to witness that, and we're all witnessing these threats uh, towards DEI has to remind us on how, how quickly things can go south how history can repeat itself, and we can't take for granted the work in progress that we've made up to this point, but that we have to renew our commitment to this work. So when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, it has to be, it has to be more than performative. Um, you know, it was Dr. King's birthday on Monday, and, and in, in my adult and professional life, I am not the, here's a quote from Dr. King, let me check this box, let me move on. Oh, I'm not that person. Right, I'm the type of person that reminds people that he was ki he was killed, right? He was assassinated at age 39. Right, throughout his work himself, Coretta Scott King, their kids were threatened daily. At the t when he lived, when he was alive, he was one of the most hated people in the United States. Simply because he was like, yeah, like we have you can't have two two sets of policies and rights for individuals. Like he was hated. FBI tapped his phones, firebombed his homes and churches. Though we celebrate him today, right? It was, it was hellacious back then. And I think we have to remind ourselves that for all groups that are underserved, historically, economically, based on whatever the, their identities are, those threats 
in various degrees exist today in our country, in our communities, and we have to do more. And our students, our employees, our colleagues, our friends here and across our state go through that. So when I'm asked the question, not just here, but in general, like what are we doing? You know, I think for starters, I separate DEI into two two buckets. There's DEI for students, DEI for employees. Starting with our employees, we work with the Human Rights Commission, the state of Connecticut. We've submitted our our equity plans, our firm, our affirmative action plans that have been approved that speak to, like, we want more diverse hiring. There needs to be better gender uh, equity and equality in our hiring and in our advancement. Um, and it's a continuous process, right? It's a marathon. When it comes to when it comes to our students, you know, Doc, um, Provost Brown mentioned, you know, we have to be data informed, and you know, the, my definition of equity is recognizing and accepting that there are inequities that exist in our institutions, in our organizations, in our communities. You have to recognize the inequities are there. We simply have to identify them, right? So, being data informed. Right, we have to take not an aggregate view, but a disaggregated view of everything that we do. Right, so the, the momentum metrics, the gateway courses, the credit load, right, um, beyond graduation rates, retention, persistence, um, the amount of credits our students are leaving with, right, whether or not whether or not they're thriving, and then as a campus community, but also as a college community, look for those gaps. Right? And upon identifying those graphs, we have to ask the question, like, why do these gaps exist? What are we doing currently that maybe is closing the gap so we can give credit and give flowers to those staff members, faculty members, and departments that are doing good work? But also look ourselves in the mirror and accept that, okay, we have a 20-point gap between this group of students and the, and the college average, or between these two subgroups of students. Are we happy about that? Do we accept that? If the answer is no, then what are we going to do about it? And, it, and it's a we thing. It's not just the guided pathways advisors that are here to help us improve our retention. It's everybody, right? Like retention is everybody's responsibility. I think there's that. I think engaging with those students and asking them and understanding them from a qualitative standpoint, tell us your lived experience, tell us about your journey. You know, we saw a video of a student who um, is happy and pleased that she gets the benefit from the UPass. But many of our students, like how many, how many connections do you have to do to get to campus? And then reverse that to get home to pick up your kids or go to work. And that's just one day. And you're on campus four days a week. So like, like what does that look like, right? And we, met, you know, we know that there's a growing, so in terms of the subgroups of students that we need to focus on, we have a high percentage of students who, uh, who are immigrants to this country. We have a sizable ESAW student population. Again, how are they doing? Beyond just the numbers, just on a human level, like how are you doing? Do you feel comfortable on our campuses? If not, what do we need to do better? Right? It's not just being culturally aware. We have to be culturally competent to know that there is a big difference between a Dominican and a, and a Cuban in terms of their lived experiences. And we have to understand that. And what, what does that mean to be a student parent, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, to me, those are the things that come to mind in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have a phenomenal leader in Dr. Shazan Cardenas, and, and he's a true warrior and a true advocate in that space. But we have warriors and advocates among, among our colleagues across the state. We have to rally together, and we have to rally around our students, especially those who find themselves on the other side of equity and say that we have to do more. And then last but not least, and I'll pass it to, to Provost Brown, we have to be unapologetic when we're speaking this truth to our legislators, right? To our, to our university partners that somehow say that our credits are less than, right? Right, like, we, like that's, where, that's where the fight is, right? And last but not least, I think there is an intersectionality with freedom of speech and academic freedom in this space. And it's really important faculty, if you feel that academic freedom is being threatened, you got to speak up and let me know and let us know. So we fight and advocate for you. And when it comes to freedom of speech, which is sometimes touchy, that we can't say, we can't yell fire in the theater, but we also can't you know, advocate for censorship or silencing those who don't have a voice. 
right? So I don't look at DEI as a mandate. I don't look at it as an initiative. I don't look at it as I want to check the box to impress whomever. I look at this. I look at DEI as life and death, right? And that it crosses so many areas. I think um, I was at Hartford Healthcare's headquarters last Friday, and, and Representative Clyburn from, from South Carolina was there. So great opportunity to meet him and, and hear him. He, he knew Dr. King. And Jeffrey Flack, the CEO of Hartford Healthcare, the largest healthcare system in the state of Connecticut, basically said, look, when you look at health outcomes through a equity or DEI lens, someone that lives in West Hartford and then someone, um, you know, a person born in West Hartford and a person born maybe eight miles away in, in northern Hartford and East Hartford, there is a 19-year gap in life expectancy, a 19-year gap simply based on where you're born. Those are the realities of inequities and disparities in our communities, what our students are facing. That is life, that's literally life and death, right? That is why we do this work. And it is hard and it's difficult, it is frustrating, and we don't always get it right. But if we don't do it, especially as a community college, based on our mission, who, who in Connecticut is gonna do this work? Because I'll remind you, we're the only institution in the state that does not turn people away. Right? Like, like, we don't believe in that, right? So we have to do more, especially in the face of what's going on in this country where literally people are, are being told, you will be fired if you, met, if you utter the word diversity. If you work in the, in the DEI department, you are done, you are gone. That's literally going on in, in, in multiple locations in this country. That is the threat. Right, that is the war, right? So what side of history do we want to be on? To me, that's a fist fight, right? And sometimes I ask the question, are you willing to die for those that you serve? I am, I'm the type of person, I'll die for, the, for my causes. That's how, that's how I'm wired, right? That's the stone I come from. Some people are like, nah, Maduko, I see my retirement year on the horizon, I don't want to rock the boat. That's your God-given right, like I'm just not wired that way, right? We all have to own it our flaws, our truth, and what more needs to be done. Well, thank you. I don't know, the next question, we're gonna talk about budget. I don't know if that's a good follow-up or not. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, we will get to the live questions. I have just two more for you. Yeah. Um, this year has levied a significant budget mitigation requirement from CT, for CT State, resulting in a direct impact on our EA employees and our services to our students. Next year looks even more gloomy if the legislature doesn't adequately fund us. Can you overview how you think we're going to go through the budget mitigation requirements and the next steps needed to balance the budget? What can we expect in February when the governor's budget comes out for fiscal year 25? Yeah, I'll answer the second part before I get to what we do with budget mitigation. I am, um, I, I, think I've, I think I've mentioned to people, uh, I'm Nigerian, right? And Nigerians, we're just, we're just, we're just raised to, uh, like brace for like the, like it's weird, you, you brace for the worst. Thanks mom and dad for instilling that sense in my mind. So, you know, I, you know, I, think, we, I think we've seen the narrative and the rhetoric um, throughout this state and it's my responsibility for us to brace for the worst. Um, and, and all indicators based on just what I'm hearing and what I'm told by individuals who are in the know, like Maduko, do not expect an additional nickel. Right, so like, like we have to prepare for that reality because we went through that this year. Like, like, like we're feeling that now. Um, now that still aligns with the level of advocacy that we're gonna do, right? So we're gonna have 12 legislative events across our campuses uh, to make our case. We're gonna work with the system office and our uh, government relations vice chancellor, Adam Joseph, in terms of the strategy and on what we're gonna seek from the General Assembly and the executive branch, but nonetheless, we have to brace um, for things to get tough. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I expect you know the you know the governor's proposed budget to, to be in line with what we've seen in the previous year, and obviously, the news headlines in Connecticut are outlining that there's a whole bunch of organizations and groups that are also saying that they're they're in. Um, they're in need of more funding, right? You have the nonprofits, you have Yukon Health, you have a lot, right? So, and you know, there's only so much funding that can go. So we, we need to not be happy about that, I'm not saying that, but we need to be pragmatic in terms of like, it's a strong reality, we're not gonna get additional funding. 
to answer the first part of your question in terms of budget mitigation, you know, we submit our budget mitigation plan um, to the Board of Regents um, November 15th, and we were able to close our $33.6 million deficit for FY24, and we were able to reduce our FY25 a $91 million deficit by $50 million, and so now it's $41 million. That's a, that's a huge chunk of change. Um, we have to be stringent in our budget mitigation, um, but the, the, the discussions I've had with the campus CEOs in our central office, vice presidents, is we, ha we have to figure out a way where it's not cookie cutter, it's, it's based on each campus, each location, prioritizing like what is of greatest need. And, in some cases, everything has needs, right? But realistically, we cannot fund everything. And I don't, I don't fault our people. I want as much funding as possible based on what we do. But the harsh reality is we're here right now, and, and, and we're going to have to brace ourselves. Um, the, the last thing I, you know, I'll add, you know, people have asked me point blank, well, Maduka, if we don't get additional funding at FY25, um, how are we going to close the gap for $41 million? And, you know, honest to God, believe me or not, there is no list. There is no list of people, departments, campuses, programs that, all right, this has happened, these are things that are going. No, because I don't accept that. I, 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 I'm doing everything in my power to advocate for us. Um, so, you know, we haven't mentioned layoffs. We haven't. There, like, there is no list. Please, FOIA our emails. You won't find that list or conversation or dialogue within CT State. Uh, but I know it's, we're, we're cutting it close come the end of this fiscal year, which, which is June 30th. And I know our collective bargaining units and others and all of you statewide and here are going to have those questions for me. And, and we're going to continue to advocate and hopefully get, get some, you know, some support and some answers. But, you know, it's it's... You know, it's looking, I don't want to use the word grim, but it's, it's, just, it's, it's looking insane right now. And that's the best answer I have. And I think um, many of you have been in Connecticut longer than me. So often I'll ask people, like when, when people are talking about our funding, I really do think people don't understand how we're funded. And I really think that people don't recognize that the reason we're affordable and the reason we're the most affordable college in the state of Connecticut, if not in New England, is that we're heavily subsidized. Because if we're not affordable, that means we're not accessible, and therefore, we're just like the other four years in this state. And somehow, I feel like there's a huge disconnect. It costs money to do the things that we do, as it should. The cost of our faculty and our staff and our resources are on par with the cost that you would see at a public four-year institution. Right? And in order for our faculty to be great and our staff to be great, they require the resources. If you undercut that, you're making it very difficult. And if there's math faculty in the room, please speak up. I don't know how you do more with less. Like mathematically, like, my, like I have a short circuit in my mind. When people say, well, just, just squeeze it more, Maduco, and magically something's going to come out. That's not how it works in the real world. Right? Um, but these are just kind of like the weird realities that we're having right here. And across the border, Massachusetts is going all in, right? And across the country, Minnesota's going all in in public higher education. So I, I see this, I know we have a need, I know we have great people in great communities that again, if we create the right conditions, they also could thrive, right? But something has to give, and that's what's going on right now, right? So let me reiterate, there is no layoff list that we've created, I haven't had that conversation, like that's the God honest truth. There is no campus closure list, that list doesn't exist because we are community colleges because we provide that access locally to our students. Like, like universities, those are destination institutions. Community colleges, like we're in your friendly neighborhood. Right, again, it aligns with just our values and our mission. But we have to do a better job telling our story. We, like, like we have to. Um, so it's gonna be buckle up season for sure. And when there's time to go to the Capitol, like we all have to rally against each other. I've, I've told union leaders, I've told even my campus CEOs, our charm as CT State is, oh, we infight. We infight, we go back and forth, we go tit for tat. We do that all day, every day. This ain't the time for it right now. Like we really have to band together, right, and make that argument you know, for Connecticut's lone community college, right? If, if, if we're gonna have any hope, you know, from, from our elected officials for support. 
thank you very much. We have one more question. We're at 1135. I really want to make sure we have enough time to open up mm -hmm. to, the, to the audience here. Um, Provost Brown, we're not going to let you off the hook. Thank God. This, <laughs> next, this next one's for you. You can have a drink of water now. This one's for you, Provost Brown. CT State enrollment has been relatively flat or, or slightly down as a whole. What ideas or initiatives do you have to build this enrollment in our year ahead? And which populations do you think we need to concentrate our efforts on in this year ahead? Yeah, so first of all, um, great question. And I would say, you know, this is a collective effort. Um, I definitely partner, I'm in my team partner with obviously the president's office, the campus CEOs, other leaders, um, Dr. Tamika Davis as the um, interim VP of enrollment services. And so um, I'll go back to November the 9th, I believe it was. Um, Dr. Davis, President Maduco, and I collaboratively uh, co-presented and shared some insights. Um, we were asked to co-present um, a report on recruitment and retention uh, strategies, right, uh, for CT State and other uh, colleges and universities within the CSCU were asked to do the same. Um, one of the things that we really believe that is low-hanging fruit opportunities and something that we can really uh, help our college um, grow um, as a comprehensive multi-campus um, institution is the undertapped uh, opportunities with high school programs is what I call it, but it's really dual enrollment, right? Dual enrollment opportunities. Um, when we think about um, the number of students that we are serving currently, while we are touching uh, that population, we can elevate the work um, there um, even more. Um, the other um, opportunities that we have really strategically talked about is, you know, healthcare um, continues to be a growth opportunity. And so we are looking at advancing um, PN programs. Uh, uh, we have on the dockets to move forward um, as it goes through the shared governance process, a PN pro LPN program um, through Quinnebog Valley, and then we would look to scale that opportunity at other campuses um, in the future. Um, another uh, you know, idea that has emerged and that we have shared um, as a collective um, has been the auto-admit processes uh, that we uh, believe we can, you know, again, make access easy for, for high school students. And so those are some of the areas um, that we know that are low-hanging fruit. But as we talked about earlier, when we talked about the workforce development, um, both non-credit and credit opportunities, um, um, there are opportunities in the non-credit space as well. We have this unique partnership um, across the state. Um, some of you may have heard of Career Connect, um, where we really focus on manufacturing, IT, and healthcare. Um, there's a population and a pipeline of students um, that we're continuing to work for um, and get them through um, those specific programs on the non-credit end as well. So we look at it, when we talk about enrollment management, there are several different buckets, right? There's not just one way to grow your institution. And so we're looking at multiple um, opportunities of growth. And then we also, and I will just put this um, shameless plug out there, we welcome insight and feedback from the brilliant minds um, across CT State who may see other things, right? Based on data, based on your experiences at faculty um, or other practitioners that are in the room. And so that's where we're heading um, at this point. And President Maduco, please add in um, as you see Fed. Now, you said that perfectly. You know, I, you know, I'll say this. We stopped the enrollment bleeding, right? So we're flat year over year, and it looks like we're up in, in our spring enrollment, right? So that's kudos. That's a testament to our faculty, staff, and leaders across the state. We're, we're not hitting those numbers without all of that, right? We were used to 5%, 8%, 10% declines year over year. We're not. Like, we're. I'll take flat enrollment yeah. versus being down minus 8%. That's one. The community colleges across the country that have stabilized their enrollment, if you look at their numbers, if you dig deep, it's because of dual enrollment. It, it, they didn't magically all of a sudden find more 18-year-olds or traditionally aged students. Right? They've now gone into the high schools. And that represents, for us, only 3% of our overall enrollment. But our neighboring states here in New England, for many of them, it's 20% of their enrollment. It's 25% of their enrollment or, high, or active duly enrolled high school students. Like, that's a huge growth opportunity. And then last but not least, you know, I recognize that, um, you, know, I, you know, again, I've said tell our story. I think as we evolve, we have to go beyond something that says CT State apply now free tuition, but really highlight our key programs across our campuses. 
so that you see that ad, you see that advertisement. Oh, I had no idea they have such and such at Middlesex. Let me exit and stop by, or let me go online and explore some more, right? So if we're not telling our story, trust me, our, our adversaries, our competitors, our, our relatives, they may or may not be telling our story. So we have to be better uh, in that vein. Thank you very much. Yep. At this point, we're going to open up to questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to come around with the uh, microphone to you. It's 1140. We've got about 20 minutes for questions. I see Rick's hands up first. And then I see Ed second. Here we go, Rick. I don't have to stand up, right? OK, yeah, perfect. I just want to make sure that I was stand up. So kind of going back on what you said with the dual enrollment piece, um, I think the idea of telling the story is being able to, one, advocate, as you said, um, the advocation part of how does classes transfer to, mm -hmm. right? Um, oftentimes, I think the community college has a, a stigma along with these classes won't go. So if you have, we've had students go to Yale, we've had students go to Harvard, we had students go to Princeton, here, right here at Middlesex. That story needs to be told as something that's attainable, right? And I think at times we hear about how um, credits are not transferring, and that story is not told. So more profiles that are sent up and saying, okay, these are the profiles of the students of who went here. There's not, um, even when we try to do the college board and try to kind of say, okay, who went where, that data gets lost when people get to the other institutions. So being able to kind of couple and make sure that data works. Um, now, as far as the workforce and being able to get into uh, different programs that leads to work. I think there's certain areas, like you said, healthcare, manufacturing, but we're also kind of missing out on some of the other things that me may be going through. Construction management mm -hmm. being one of them. Development is going everywhere. Being someone from New Haven, there's always some construction going on. Um, highway bridging and all, all kinds of other stuff that needs to be done. I think there just needs to be a little bit more poaching those opportunities and say, hey, what, can we retrain you guy, your guys or your uh, employees and say, what can we do to make sure that we're making, bringing everybody up to speed? And I think those are opportunities. And I was wondering, what does that look like for us? And how does that happen for us? Especially saying, okay, like English 101 is gonna go. Math, your entry level statistics is gonna go. And then what is the training looking like for business and opportunities for them to come to us to get their uh, employees trained? Yeah. Uh, just so, so thank you for that. That's spot on. I see Provost Brown taking notes. Like we have to own it. I, I think often, what what I've what I've gleaned is we're told wh what space we should be in, and we're told the benefits of potential partnerships versus we're pushing and driving that agenda for ourselves based on how we see that. I think two telling the story not only for transfer, but I think holding our transfer partners accountable, right? So again, there's a difference between transferring and credits being applied to a course of study at a four year. Those are two that you can transfer anything you want. doesn't mean it's going to get you closer to the finish line. But I think that's one. I think two, we have to bake in data agreements within the MOUs to say quarterly or peri periodically, we're going to exchange data so we know exactly how our students are doing at said institution. Um, and I think in terms of just the workforce piece, I think we all have to be entrepreneurs, right? So I think in this state, to your point, you're kind of speaking to customized training. Like you have a workforce, but maybe they're underskilled. Allow our faculty, credit or non-credit, to come in and pack, package together courses, uh, modules, whatever, to upskill your individuals while they continue to work for your organization. So those are the things that, per, you know, per Provost Brown and others, really leading that charge, but it has to be through our voice versus someone else has been dictating to us for a long time. We're, we're working on ending that type of one-sided type of dynamic. Dr. Madugo, you often mention and refer back to stabilize, build, and thrive as the next steps for CT State. In your vision, A, have we stabilized? What does thriving look like for us? And how will we know when we can move to building, especially in this budget climate? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think um, we are stabilizing. Have we stabilized? No, I mean, I, I look, we're all firefighters right now, and, and all due respect to the real fighter fighters and first responders, but I think everyone in this room across the state, we're putting out fires every, every minute, right? 
right? Smoke on her face and just, we had, again, there's that CT state look that we just look at each other. It's not disdain, it's more so a glare that, you know, here we go. But I, I remind all of us, you know, we are, um, what is it? We are six months and 18 days old, right? Like we are, we are a brand new institution, right? So we're discovering things that, that hell, we didn't add or include it in the original plan. So that's the process of stabilization. Um, I think too, building, you know, there's a faculty member uh, that I won't mention, mention her name, but I'll mention her name, Nicola Ricker out of Three Rivers. And, you know, we were talking about something and I said that, you know, I, I, I'm always open to faculty and staff and leaders putting forth recommendations on how we can better improve the institution or saying that, hey, Maduka, we had this mandate, we had this idea, but we don't think it's gonna bode well for us. We have a counter to that. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I fully support that. And she said, Maduka, I don't think people believe that. I think people feel like if, if there's a recommendation to change or do something, here's a scarlet letter, right? You're categorized, like, like you're on the naughty list and there it goes. And, that, and, like, and to me, that's absurd through my lens, but I understand the lived experiences of everyone who's been here longer than me, right? So we need more of that to help us stabilize. And then come the, come the new academic year, I really want to have a conversation with the college. You know, we have a transitional strategic plan out of necessity, just based on we were on fire and just trying to land this plane. But I think we, we need a comprehensive strategic plan that our colleagues across the state see themselves in. Right, and that we're having focus groups and we're really gathering ideas in terms of what should this college be? What should be baked into our planning? I really look forward to that, to that process. So we're not there yet, we're not stabilized, but we're stabilizing and you know, I, I still think we need time before we can get to thriving. We're still crawling and, and wetting ourselves, right? We've yet to be potty trained and sprint and do things. And again, I have a toddler at home, so that, that's a terminology <laughs> I use, but we're, we're gonna get there, right? We're gonna get there. Okay, time check, we're at 11.47. We have Michelle up and then Jen. So you know you can't go by without a question from me. Never. No, thanks. <laughs> so, Dr. Brown, first of all, I want to thank you for giving us a voice. Dr. Brown has been open to workforce and has listened to the 12 of us, like it or not, he's heard us all. But here's the question for both of you. Yeah. We hear a student is a student, but there's an equity gap for our students, right? Our workforce students jump through different hoops. They can't register online. They do not have free programs. Yes, we have some grants coming in, but that only covers a level of people. That doesn't cover the mom working two jobs and then, you know, she can't pay for our courses. How are we really going to make, and we have some old guard that really just disregards non-credit as non-credit, right? So how are we breaking down that wall where we're building equity for our students and for our staff not running a college within a college, not having access to all the um, departments that everyone else has? Also, you know, not here. But we've been told that we can't buy bus passes for our students anymore. For higher up, $40. It used to be built in our courses. It's built into the credit side. But our own students can't buy that cheap bus ticket. We cannot give SNAP money anymore to that $40 ticket to get our students here. That's not equity. That is not a student is a student. That is a wall put up. How are we going to break down that wall? Like really just knock yeah. it down. Yeah. So, so I'll, yeah. you touch the workforce side, I'll touch the, the actual side. So shame on us, right? Sim simple as that, shame on us. I can't, I can't explain it, I can't excuse it. Shame on us if we're not something as, as um, important as, as transportation, we're saying no you know, to our students. So that's one. Um, I think two, I, I will say this, you are, one of maybe 10 people that actually articulates the needs for a non-credit student. Oh, I, I rarely get those, get those concerns. So we, we have to be better. We all have to look ourselves in the mirror. Um, I think too, on the federal and national level, we're taking a team to DC in two weeks to advocate for the expansion of Pell Grants for non-credit. And I know that there's proposals on the docket um, that's bipartisan, so like that's hopeful. I think too, there's opportunities for us to better engage with our foundations, to really let them know that you, you, you should be at the will of the institution. And if a student's a student, we need to kind of expand our ability for scholarship dollars for any student, regardless of credit type. And then two, in terms of our success stories, so telling the pain points of a student who wants to get better, 
but can't because of these institutional, organizational, systemic barriers. We have to speak to that. But those students that had the breakthroughs and now they're gainfully employed in their career, have some economic mobility, we, we equally have to tell that story as well. But when it comes to some of the things, the restrictions that are, that are institutional, like send me, the, send me the master list and let's start chipping away at those barriers to start. Provost, did you want to add in or? Yeah, I'll, I'll just support that notion of the list, right? I, I think it is a a shifting and a resetting of, of the, the approach, right? Because I think it's been perhaps siloed for so long, right? And, and, and this it's not just a CT state thing. It, it's happened in other state settings that I've been in as well. And so working together, having these types of real conversations, pulling the list together, and really also, again, I'm a big fan of, you know, what are the successful organizations doing? Like, what are those North Stars? Like, who's getting it right? And I think we have to expose our ourselves to those colleagues um, in other settings as well and just really start hammering away at removing um, those barriers that exist and again approaching the student as a student um, not just in in verbiage but in action yeah yeah thank you Jen next we're gonna go to Steve in the back hi good morning dr. Jennifer Hernandez um, so I am glad to hear that you were speaking in reference to having some focus groups at a later date um, to kind of process some of the change, uh, change that has taken place. I'm interested to know if there's going to be anything in a sooner date in reference to um, assessing like the, the standards of practice in terms of even on, on registering online. Uh, I did a quick search yesterday, for example, as, I, as I've been <clears throat> perplexing over my colleagues and uh, some of our traditional classroom enrollments and recognizing that throughout the state, there is an enormous amount of online offerings with very few traditional on site for certain programs. With that being said, what happens is, is that when you get online, when you get online to register, certain schools come up first. And so if you're interested in online, which perhaps is where the market is trending, right? Those schools that are on the top get those course those students enrolled first and so as you look down it you know we see we see the decrease in enrollment in certain places so that's one area of really concern uh, throughout the process of the transition to CC state when you say the idea of focus groups too I really hope that those are some of the things those user-friendly things could get happening a little sooner um, because there's some really good examples of time suckers that have happened to us as faculty or program coordinators Whereas simple things like the fact that legacy degrees and, and the new degrees, like we couldn't have had some computer smart person, I'm a social science person, right? but create a check box rather than us having these tedious amounts of layers of different places to go. Now I see that there's been some efforts at some improvement, but it's almost like we need somebody to sit back that's not in it mm -hmm. and fix it, yeah. give us recommendations because when we're looking at the idea of this organizational change, we're adding areas of frustration that is just simply not needed if we had pulled back a little bit and looked at some of the real user friendliness. And I'm concerned about the idea that so many of our courses, there are certain schools that are monopolizing the online learning too. So some of us were saying we want to, we're going to give it the traditional try, even though we see that the market is trending towards online learning. We're still trying, like we're going to give it a good try to get our students back on campus, and then we we sit here with utter despair <laughs> in the idea that some of our courses are running low um, to to meet our needs. So. I guess what I'm saying in summary is that I think that there's, I'm hoping that there's a little bit more attentiveness to some of the details of process sooner than later because it's creating chaos that's unnecessary. And I think we just need to have a step back a little bit um, and some guidance from some of the leadership that has been put into place that um, may, may be helpful um, if we can sort out what their roles are and their expectations are and help. Yeah, so, so, so I, I think you beautifully said that, so I don't want to, you know, uh, tarnish that. But I think one, you know, we need an online strategy, right? Like, we, like we need an online, like, like what does that look like? There's tension in, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it like this, there's tension in online. Because I, I hear both camps. Maduka, we shouldn't do it at all. And then Maduka, we do it well, why can't we expand it? Like, and we have to have, we have, we have, to have that college-wide discussion. 
And, and my stance is I don't, I don't um, I'm not a proponent of forcing any faculty member to teach in a specific, specific modality, no. But the idea that we're not going to have our say and our stance and our strategy in the online space when we know that online's been here for such a long time if we're not doing it, someone else is going to do it. Like we, like we have to accept it. But I, but I recognize quality, and I recognize guardrails, and I recognize student learning outcomes and pedagogy and all those different things. You can't just take a residential course and shove it online. There's a process. So, I'm there. I think too on the distribution of online sections between campuses or whatever. Again, we need a strategy on, on what does that look like and what are the pain points. And then last but not least, I think to my point earlier, I think everyone's putting out fires. And like we're chipping away versus like what is like the problem with our processes? What is it that we're not doing through the faculty lens, through the staff lens, and then proposing basically a game plan, a strategy, and investment both in, in personnel or personnel capacity, but also resources to get out of it. I think right now like we're just like trying to push this boulder uphill when it comes to all of these things that I don't think that it was bad intentions. I just think like to merge 12 institutions is, was insane, right? I think we're gonna say that until, until we're in dirt or, 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 or ash or whatever, however you wanna end your life or whatever. So, um, yeah, I digress. Um, so we have to, um, so, so, so we have to work on that, but I think it goes back to, I know there's hesitation, if not fear of Maduka, like if I openly and publicly speak out against it, am I deemed anti state Like, no, you're not deemed anti state You're a proponent and advocate of the institution, and we need more of those voices. So I got to do better to create the platform by which all of us can be at that table to speak to. Maduka, this thing is just simply broken, and we're putting Band-Aids. We need something else, or we need different people involved to usher this through. Wait a minute. Let me give you the microphone. We're at 1157. Is, is that what I think you're, we're hearing is definitely there's some trends in online learning. That that's it's been done. We can do it Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. There's not, but the issue is right now we have a computer system, uh, you know, that you log on to, and certain schools are are getting the hit first. Mm -hmm. So we've we've. Now we know that this is a problem. And yeah, so we got to fix that. Agreed. Therefore, it's going to continue to affect mm -hmm. us. So we have that's a larger a larger conversation to sort out. But that's Agreed. Really and we can follow up with that. It's eleven fifty seven. We got three minutes to go. I got one more question here. We have two others. We're probably not going to get to. So I'm going to ask you ask your question. Don't frame it. Just ask the question, answer it, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay. Thank you for being here. I would like to say, in following up on this budget matter. Um, the union is, is entering another negotiation cycle. We're, gonna, we're negotiating both on language and on money. We've been through this problem for such a long time. In the Roland era, if, if those of you who were around in the 90s, we had a fight and scratch for every contract we got, and I think that's not fair. We need to protect our members' jobs. We have a lot of new people. We're doing good work. And yet, why is the public sector under attack nationally, this is not a statewide problem. And so I, we've had this email campaign to get the legislature and the governor to support us, yet how come they don't want to fund us? I, something, something's very wrong with this, and I think there's a fight here. If we want to have equity that you've well spoken to, and I go back to the King days, so I, I remember all that, that there's, there's something wrong with this picture that they don't want to fund us, that we're treated as second-class citizens, and I don't want to see anybody on, in our system laid off. So something's very wrong with this, and we better address it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Arlen, you're up next, um, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. We'll have your question answered for you, okay? I feel, like this, I feel like this is Donahue, <laughs> Ms. Hogan. I love it. It's awesome. Gentlemen, thank you, and, and almost dovetailing with what he said, and, and the question I have is about the, the messaging and the communication for the governor, the legislature, and again, we, we've had the 70,000 students, we have, we're the land of second chances and the land of first chances where no one else has, is giving them the chance. 
in addition to what you're doing, we have a whole army out here. What more do you think we can do as individuals? Because I've spoken to some lawmakers and historically they've been much more open. I feel like we're hitting a dead end. I'm talking to state senators, state representatives. How can we individually assist your efforts in the messaging uh, and the communications for how important we are to our community? I would just, um, I'm, I, yeah, look, 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 which I will never do. I'm not a fan, again, diplomacy is necessary, but I think, you know, we, we have the proof that no one, the majority of our students are actually from Connecticut, and the majority of the people we, we teach, support, develop, stay in Connecticut. Like, like the others cannot say that. I think that's one. I think, two, all of the professions, all of the sectors, all the municipalities, rural, suburban, urban, we touch it. Right, we, like we look like Connecticut. There are other institutions, like they do not look like Connecticut. I think we speak to that. And, and, and last but not least, I think the deficit mindset has killed us. So yes, there are not snakes on the plane, there are snakes on campus here, and I do not, right? Like that, like that, is, the, that is the truth, right? However, as infuriating as that is, there, are, there is greatness here in Middlesex, and there is greatness across our campuses, and we do not tell that story on, we cannot start with snakes, right? We like, right? We can't end with snakes either, please. Right, right, yeah, right. We have to speak to the great things that you're doing. I think we need more of that and really hitting home, you know, the industries that are really important to these individuals, you know, legislators. Like, who else is training more nurses than us, right? And that our graduates don't leave with debt to the degree of the four years and the privates and et cetera. We gotta hit that home. Okay, sorry. I just wanna make sure we're still, we didn't cut off our feed, that our people are still hearing us. Yeah, okay. It's after 12. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm sorry for those of you that in the audience that did not get to ask all your questions. Those of you in the virtual setting, we thank you for being with us today. Dr. Maduka, I'm gonna ask that you just wrap it up for us. Dr. Brown, Dr. Maduka, thank you for being here. Once we wrap up, we'll go to close. Yeah, you know, again, you. happy new year, happy 2024. Welcome back faculty, welcome back everyone. Uh, can't wait to see our students across our campuses, um, you know, tomorrow. Um, you know, we need you, right? The, the engine of CT State is our faculty, staff, and our leaders. And I get, I get the privilege of serving you. And I've told people, because people ask me, Duke, please don't leave, or I hope you don't get fired. I'm like, how do you start a conversation that way? But. <laughs> But, but what I tell people is I'll, I'll stay here as long as people want me, but again, my job is to serve all of you and advocate for all of you. I don't mind being the bad guy if that means we can squeeze out more funding and more resources and eliminate barriers, right? But you are the power in this institution and, and without you, you're nothing. So I really am indebted and appreciative and humbled uh, not only to serve you, but really see the greatness that you do day in and day out, right? So the spring semester is here. Um, let's pray, let's meditate, let's do whatever we have to do, but let's have a strong semester, and let's make the case that we are a great institution. So thank you so much, thank you for your time, and for our campuses across the, across the state, you now can get back to your own local um, um, PD and things that you're doing in, in preparation for start of the semester. So again, thank you everyone, and have a good rest of your day. We'll see you at the virtual offer hours on February 8th, three to four. We're told to plug that in. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yep, sweet. Thank you.